The Pirus, now known today as the Stone Age, is well known by many of those who aren't even familiar with the science behind it, and said time was quite the broad prehistoric period, during which the use of stone was widely used to make a variety of tools, leading to great advancements in human technology and society, eventually leading us to today, where through this combination of technology and societal changes, I'm even able to project my voice through created videos to people all over the world through a vast network known as the Internet. This series will be done in two parts, the first covering the Paleolithic and the first half of the Mesolithic, and the second will wrap up the former and discuss the last period, the Neolithic. As indicated by the title, this is indeed a collaboration between me and Northo2, another science-based YouTuber who, while also making a great deal of zoology and paleontology content, has many great videos covering human history as well, and I would recommend subscribing to him, as this is where the second video in the series will be uploaded. So, with that, I hope you enjoy this dive into the beginnings of the Stone Age, starting first in the Paleolithic. The first period of the Stone Age, being the Paleolithic, is divided up into three subdivisions, being the Lower, Middle, and Upper, all having some distinction between one another, although the chronology between them is quite murky, as we'll later find out. It is also worth noting that, while not entirely necessary for the topics discussed in this video, the tombs Stone Age, Bronze Age, and Iron Age are not intended to suggest that advancements and time periods in prehistory are measured only by the type of tool materials used, but that they are also measured by social organisation, food sources and their availability, agriculture, settlements, and adaptations to different areas. They therefore serve primarily as diagnostics of days, rather than characterising the peoples or societies of the time. The Stone Age itself lasted for roughly 3.4 million years, only ending between 4000 to 2000 BCE, with the advent of metalworking through the melting and smelting of copper. This period of human history, starting with the Lower Paleolithic, which includes our hominin ancestors, represents the beginning of technological innovation over time, with the Paleolithic as a whole extending from around 3.4 million years ago to the end of the Pleistocene, around 11,650 years ago, representing around 99% of human technological prehistory. The Lower Paleolithic spans from around 2.5 million years ago when the first solid evidence of craft and use of stone tools by hominins appearing in the current archaeological record until around 300,000 years ago. The oldest indirect evidence found of the use of stone tools dates back to around 3.4 million years ago, with them being found in the Lower Awash Valley in Ethiopia. Because of this state, in the Pliocene Epoch, they were considerably older than even the first known tool users, being Homo habilis by about a million years, with them perhaps being constructed by animals like Australopithecus and Paranthropus, with there being evidence of the former using stone that they either picked up and or crafted to butcher meat, also leaving imprints on food items they either scavenged or brought down in some way. The more well-known and established earliest tools belong to an industry known as the Older One, after the type size of Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania, also known as Mode 1, and while being quite primitive, still show quite a high level of precision, innovation and intelligence. These tools were formed by knocking pieces off of river pebbles or stones similar to them with a hammerstone to obtain an end result consisting of large and small pieces with one or more sharp edges with the original stone being known as the core and the resulting pieces as flakes. There is also evidence that these tools were used in percussion technology, in which they were designed to be gripped at the blunt ends and then be used to strike something with the sharper edges, from which they were given the name of choppers, which would have been quite useful for butchering animals, confirmed by the presence of mammalian blood cells on some tools. There has also been evidence of plant residues bonded to the silicon of some tools, which confirms some were also used to chop up plants. The animals more than likely responsible technology were animals known as Homo habilis, the earliest known of our genus to do so, and with the evolution of the more derived Homo erectus, which lived alongside habilis, these tools were shared by a number of hominins over similar ranges, perhaps even subsisting in different niches. These hand axes lasted for quite a while across hominin history, being used from about 2.6 million years ago to about 1.5 million years ago in Africa, and up to 500,000 years ago outside of the continents in Europe and Asia. The next set of tools, known as the Acheulean or Mo2 tools, were first known from a 1.7 through 1.6 million year old layer in West Turkana in Kenya, which are predominantly associated with Homo erectus. Mo's two tools are generally bifaced, consisting of two concave surfaces intersecting to form a cutting edge all the way around the tool, although some do differ, with more planning and precision going into the manufacturing of these tools. 
The manufacturer of any one tool first hits a slab off of a large rock to use as a blank, with large flakes then being struck off and worked into bifaces through hard hammer percussion on a given anvil stone. The edges of the tool are then retouched, with smaller flakes being hit off with a bone or a softened wooden hammer to either sharpen or resharpen. Although Mode 2 tools are generally easily distinguished from Mode 1 tools, there is occasionally a close similarity, which can lead to some confusion. One distinguishing factor is the size of the flakes, as in contrast to the old one small flake tradition, Acheulean is large flaked. This technology and weaponry allowed Homo erectus as a species to be quite the successful predators, and with their intelligence were able to form coordinated groups and formulate strategies to best capture prey items, as well as being able to better care for disabled and or injured companions, something which greatly assisted them and reinforced social bonds. They also managed a controlled use of fire around the same time as well, helping not only for warmth and as a predator deterrent, but also to unthaw meat, as well as potentially being able to utilise rafts to reach other landmasses, although this is still debated over. Alongside the hand axe tradition, the development of a distinct and very different stone-based industry came bells. Debatable, as it varies depending on place to place, depending on different areas of the world, with some considering the periods as one long sequence being the earlier Paleolithic. A general transition point is regarded by some as around 300,000 years ago, during which Neanderthals came to become more prevalent tool users, and ending around 28,000 years ago as the technology became more specialised and advanced. A different tool making technique also developed around this time known as the prepared core technique, which increased the efficiency of the tool and its creation by the creation of more controlled and consistent flakes. In contrast to the production of core tools, like hand axes, where the cores themselves were the end product shapes and trimmed down by the removal flakes, through the prepared core technique, the large flakes are the products and the core is used to produce them. This shift made it faster and more resource efficient to produce a variety of tools, as multiple tools, many of which were more specialised as we'll get into, could be struck from a single piece of starting material. This eventually allowed for Middle Paleolithic humans to create stone-tipped spears, which allowed for not only more power and precision, but also range, created by hafting sharp flakes stone flakes onto wooden shafts, allowing for larger prey items to be targeted, as well as from further away, mainly through ambushing rather than throwing them from a distance, as would be more common later on. Harpoons also appear in the geologic record around 90,000 years ago, allowing fish to be another staple in the diets of many, allowing for more variety and options for communities. By the end of the Middle Paleolithic, the recently evolved Homo sapiens, having a more complex brain structure, evidently were more adventurous, arriving in Australia, Northern Europe and even Japan all before the end of the Paleolithic, reaching all of these areas relatively quickly. Before we delve into this stage in the Paleolithic, the Upper Paleolithic and the transition from the Middle Paleolithic is quite the controversial debate, and is an issue of terminological ambiguities, chronological and geographical aspects of change, as well as the emergence of modern forager societies and their behaviour. Historically, the Upper Paleolithic designated the time when modern Homo sapiens, generally referred to as Cro-Magnons, replaced the Neanderthals across much of their range, with the cultural manifestations of blade-dominated lithic assemblages, along with cave arts, and more advanced technologies being seen as hallmarks of the achievements of the newer arrivals. However, doubts soon emerged, and many questions were raised, such as how long Neanderthals survived in the various regions of Eurasia, the identity of the bearers of the varying prehistoric cultures, like the Chassel Peronian, Aragnassian, Gravitian, and others, as well as whether prehistoric migrations or climatic changes were the main causes for cultural change. There is also a separate debate, such as whether the transition of the two ages was a major evolutionary event of global dimensions or a gradual transition, and what the impetus for such change was, as well as if this was the point in time where one can interpret said evidence as the emergence of modern behaviour. Several scholars view the accumulation of markers for modern behaviours gradual during the time, concluding therefore there was no revolution in technology and culture at such a rapid pace. 
Most researchers do however agree that they observed cultural and technological traits, as well as the population increase during the Upper Paleolithic, was indeed more rapid and had distinct global effects across Eurasia and Africa when compared with the slow pace of cultural changes during the Middle Paleolithic. The problem with understanding transition periods in archaeology is a result of a continuity problem, which examines how discrete objects of any sort that are continuous in any way can be presumed to have a relationship of some sort. As an example, if a hypothetical period B can be presumed to descend from period A, there must therefore be a boundary between them. The problem, however, lies in the nature of this boundary, as if it is not distinct enough, then the population of A suddenly shifting to B makes for an unlikely scenario in the process of evolution. More realistically, a distinct border period, as an example, an A slash B transition, in which the customs of A were gradually dropped and those of B acquired at a relatively slow and transitional pace, although this still leaves gaps in our understanding. One approach suggests that there were gradual cultural changes between the two ages, with an accumulation of material and behavioural traits finally leading to the formation of an upper Paleolithic structure of society and culture, with there being no large-scale revolution in either Eurasia or in Africa. A second consists of shift as occurring more or less contemporary in most regions, with supporters of this approach being split among those who see the transition as accomplished by local populations, i.e. in Europe by Neanderthals, and others who view the final establishment of the Upper Paleolithic as solely a Homo sapiens achievement. The third and final view stresses the origin of said revolution in a core area of innovation that dispersed alongside human groups that shared similar social systems and means of communication that allowed for the essential components of the new technologies and, and how to make them into new territories. Proponents of this model have therefore viewed this cultural revolution as being triggered either by biological change or by socio-economic circumstances. There was indeed quite the shift between the ages, as will be discussed, with some of the achievements of the time, including the long-distance exchanges of raw materials, as well as the eventual occupation of more northern latitudes and the Americas, as well as the first steps in coastal navigation. Other changes and developments were assisted by the advent of behavioural modernity, which is comprised of a set of traits that distinguish Homo sapiens from other now-extinct hominin lineages, which with the highly developed brains, created even more advanced and specialised tools and culture. Aragnassian tools came about around this time, with there being an increased variety of stone-bladed tools, as well as others made of antlers and bones. As well as this, the clothing, which was likely in use as far back as 190,000 years ago, became more sophisticated, with what appears to be some form of sewing needles being found around 40,000 years ago, as well as dyed flax fibres, which date to around 36,000 years ago. The use of body decorations like beads and pendants, which were made from marine shells, teeth and ivory, have also been recorded, which appears to communicate the self-awareness and identity of social units, with no similar objects being recorded in Middle Paleolithic environments to this extent. Advancements in clothing, alongside other technology like nets, bowlers and spear throwers, increase the hunting efficiency of hunting parties tremendously, with the oldest example of ceramic art being dated to around 29,000 through 25,000 years ago and the navigation of some 60 kilometres of open water around the Solomon Islands also has evidence for occurring around this time. There is also evidence of long-distance exchange networks of lithics and raw materials that's reached the order of several hundred kilometres, and even storage facilities, mainly known of from northern latitudes, where underground freezing was able to keep food edible for longer periods of time. Overall, the Paleolithic was comprised of hunter-gatherers who travelled to hunt game and gather wild plants, undergoing fairly minimal changes in technology. However, as the last glacial period of the current ice age neared its end, larger prey animals became extinct and climates worldwide changed. To adapt, Homo sapiens, now the last remaining hominins, sought to maximise the resources in their local environments, making a next stage into what is now known as the Mesolithic period. The type of cultures associated with the Mesolithic varies between areas, with it beginning and ending in Southwest Asia through 20,000 and 8,000 years ago, and 15,000 through 5,000 years ago in Europe. The period is largely defined by a decline in the group hunting of large animals in favour of a broader hunter-gatherer way of life, with the development of more sophisticated and typically smaller lithic tools and weapons being utilised over the heavy chipped equivalents commonly found in the Paleolithic. Tools like microliths, which include small bladelets and microburins, have also been found to have emerged during this period, with spears and arrows being found at the site of Jebel Sahaba in Sudan, with a number of skeletons being found that were around 11,600 years old, 
half of which being found with arrowheads embedded in their skeletons, making the site one of the earliest known warfare sites in the world, with it potentially occurring in the wake of a local ecological crisis. The rest of the Mesolithic, alongside the entirety of the Neolithic, will be continued on with Northo 2 in his next video, which you can watch here for more on how our technology continued to adapt and change when agriculture became established, and changed how we functioned as a species. The timescale of our development and where these phases occurs varies enormously from region to region, and being in a field with quite a fair amount of debate, I hope that with this video and the next part in this collaboration, you've learned something new about the variable mosaic of archaeological and human fossil data, and the varying interpretations of said data. With that, I'll hand over to Northo2 to cover the remaining portion of this remarkable story of human development. I hope you enjoy the next part all the same as this one, and that you may even learn something new. Thanks for watching.